Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? You were at the first service. <clears throat> what? Because they're so good at it, yes. No, it's all right. That's why you never see them hiding in trees, because they're so good at hiding. All right. Why did the blind man fall into the well? Because he couldn't see that well. <laughs> a man tried to sell me a coffin the other day. I told him it was the last thing I would ever need. <laughs> when does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes apparent. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Parenthood is no joke. It can be simultaneously the most frustrating and enjoyable, exhausting and exhilarating, heartwarming and heart-wrenching experience in our lives. As high as the highest highs are, the lows can be equally as low. And this is something God knows all about, according to our reading from Hosea this morning. The prophet Hosea compares God's relationship to Israel with the relationship that a parent has with a child. And in this metaphor, the child has not been obedient but instead has disappointed their parent by turning from him. Oh, those kids. Oh, you kids. How you like to take our hearts and squeeze real tight. In roughly 730 BC, Hosea was a prophet in the northern kingdom, much like Elijah had been, um, who we read about last Sunday. Elijah was a, a prophet during the time of King Ahab, and we talked about Ahab as being the worst king that Israel had ever had. Um, Hosea was prophet while King Hosea was king. And this was at the end of the northern kingdom's run as a kingdom, right before and including the time when they were conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C., so Hosea speaks during a time of transition for the Israelites. And the book of Hosea begins with allusions of Israel as being like an unfaithful wife to God. And Hosea knew something about this for his wife Gomer had been unfaithful to him. So he writes of what he speaks. And then in chapter four, the metaphor shifts to this relationship between a parent and a child. And that metaphor is uh, picked up again in chapter 11, where our reading comes from this morning when the prophet Hosea, speaking for Yahweh, says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This beginning is a reference to both God's covenant relationship with the Israelites through Abraham and Moses, as well as their exodus out of Egypt. But the strain of that parent and child relationship, it begins to be revealed in the second verse of our reading, where we read, the more I called them, the more they went from me. Have you ever had that experience with a young person? Fortunately, our kids weren't really runners, but I see it occasionally in the preschool where one of the children doesn't come when they are called. In fact, they go the other way. And what they want to do is to be chased. But if as parents, we aren't sure that we can catch them, we probably shouldn't start chasing them because they'll get further and further away. And as they are running, and looking back at us, but not listening, but looking and watching and laughing and giggling, they aren't watching where they are going and we can see them headed into peril, headed into danger, headed into the street, into the parking lot, off a cliff. Thank the roadrunner. 
Wiley Coyote. Unfortunately, some children never outgrow this impulse to run from their parents or caregivers. And maybe as adults, they don't literally run away, but they move away. They ignore the care, the protection, the advice of a loving parent as they move towards the unsafe things in the world. And the more the parent calls towards them, the further they run or move away from them so that eventually they can't hear them anymore. I watched a documentary this weekend on Netflix about a a cult where young people were searching for love and gave up all of their own autonomy, willingly gave it up to this, this man and his wife. Tons of money. And of course, like all cults, they were told to turn their backs on their families, their parents. And the parents just grieved watching their children doing these things that they knew were harmful to themselves because they trusted these other people so much more. God knows the pain and the frustration of a child turning from him because Israel has done it time and time and time again. And if only it was in the past, but we do it time and time and time again ourselves. Then Yahweh reflects upon all that he has done for Ephraim. Ephraim was one of Jacob's uh, 12 sons. So Ephraim is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. In fact, Jeroboam, who was king when the the kingdom was divided, uh, was from the tribe of Ephraim. So this reference to Ephraim is is a reference not only to Jeroboam, but to the entire northern kingdom. So Yahweh taught Ephraim, the northern kingdom, to walk. And Yahweh held them in his arms. But they didn't know it was him that healed them. We talked a couple of weeks ago about how quickly we forget. And Israel has forgotten. Forgotten all that, that Yahweh has done for them. You see, the people were unaware of all that God had done for them, much like a child is unaware of the love and the sacrifices that a parent, caregiver, or guardian makes for them. They just don't know. They don't know. They are ungrateful, but they don't mean to be because they aren't aware of all the sacrifices that we make for them. They take it for granted because they just don't know. I've often thought that infants are the most selfish human beings in existence. Think about it. All they do is think about themselves. I'm hungry, I'm wet, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm wet, I'm tired, and on and on and on it goes. Infants don't have the capacity to have empathy, to think of the other aside from what the other can do for them. It's all about getting their needs met. Hosea continues in our reading saying that God was to the northern kingdom like those little infants or like those who lift infants to their cheeks. Oh, a baby's cheek. My, My cheek's a little rough. Those smooth cherubic cheeks of a baby. So tender and smooth. I'm assuming those are the cheeks he's talking about here. Not that smooth as a baby's bottom cheeks. And the reading goes on. I bent down to them and fed them, Yahweh says, employing both motherly and fatherly images of love and care for God's people. You see, that's how it is. God's love is unconditional. This is a characteristic that we typically associate with God from the New Testament. But our reading comes 700 years before Jesus was born. The God of the Old Testament is often characterized as being angry and judgmental and capricious, but not here. Not here where God is being described as tender, nurturing, loving, and caring. And yet, yet when we go astray, there will be consequences. They shall return to the land of Egypt and Assyria shall be their king, Hosea says in verse 5, because they have refused to return to me. 
God holds up this, this image of their return to the bondage of slavery, their return to what their life was like in Egypt, as well as a foreshadowing of what life will be like when the Assyrians conquer them and become their king. You see, their fall appears to be the natural consequence of their ongoing running and turning from God. Think of it as a, an extended time out. They've been sent to their room, or actually sent out of their room, out of their country, into captivity in Assyria. A time out with horrible consequences. Unfortunately, they are receiving the consequences for their behavior, the, the result of the danger that God had warned them of as they were running and away from God. They're like a spoiled child who has thrown one too many tantrums and pushed their parents to the limit who finally gives them their punishment. And yet, yet then we read verses eight and nine as Miss Joanne pointed out in the children's message. God's heart is changed. God has compassion. Like a parent, God loves God's children unconditionally. And God doesn't give up on them. God doesn't give up on us. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. How much I want to punish you for not cleaning your room, John Paul, but then I come. And I join you in cleaning it up. My compassion grows warm and tender. Because of God's deep love for God's people, God's heart is softened and God's mind is changed. God chooses not to abandon us and turn away from us like a child does their parents because God's gracious love knows no limits. Even when we turn and we go astray, even when we deny God and put our confidence in the things of this world instead of God, God does not abandon us. In this documentary, there were mothers who hadn't spoken to their children for four years who were reaching out to their kids, referring to their children by new names that their child had said they wanted to be referred to as. They didn't do it because they understood, they did it because they loved their child and would do anything to have them turn back to them and at least to have a relationship. Even when we deserve it, and Lord knows we do, God will not execute God's fierce anger toward us. For just as Hosea says in verse 9, God is God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath. I will not come in wrath, for God comes in love. And God is a much better parent than we could ever hope to be. I think we could all admit that. For God's basic desire is that God's children would return back to him. And that, my friends, is why God has sent God's one and only Son. Not to appease God's wrath and anger, not to punish someone in our place, but out of God's abundant love for us. So that we might finally stop running from God. And instead run toward the loving, caring, life-giving arms of our Creator. Let the children come to me. Let the children come to me, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Jesus said it in our gospel reading this morning, inviting the children, inviting all of us to him. Come, he says, come to me. Come to this table where we remember that he has already been punished for our disobedience. Though the consequences for our sin are death, Jesus has died in order that we no longer need to die, but that we might have life through him. This is the good news of the God of both the Old Testament and the New. 
The God who continues to seek a loving relationship with us, even when we ignore God, even when we run from God, even when we pretend like God doesn't exist. God is there. God is here. In the breaking of the bread, in the fellowship that we have with each other, God is downstairs waiting for us to finish cleaning our room. And then God comes up and he cleans it with us. Not in wrath, but in love. Thanks be to God. Amen.